Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, hearing number 35, which is our last hearing in the 191st period of sessions. And the title of the hearing is Impact of Gun Violence and Human Rights in the United States. And it's a hearing requested by the George Washington Law School, Civil and Human Rights Law Clinic, and Global Action on Gun Violence. I want to welcome representatives of civil society organizations here, and certainly I want to welcome the representatives of the state, led by Ambassador Mora. Um, the, 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 the purpose of this hearing, of the objective of this hearing, is to underscore the gaps in the legislative framework and assess the, its adequacy in addressing the current gun violence crisis in the United States particularly within the broader context of the state's due diligence obligations under the Inter-American Human Rights Obligations. In the background that we've received, and I don't want to get ahead of the presentations, but it, it is rather shocking. In 2022, 48,204 people died from firearm-related injuries in total, including almost 20,000 homicides. Um, in 2023, firearm-related injuries reached an average of 108 people a day. I think we would see that's a crisis. Um, and in fact, in June 2024, the U.S. Surgeon General Advisory Report declared firearm violence to be a public health crisis in the United States and a leading cause of death for children. For quite a while, we've been thinking within the Commission of holding an ex officio hearing on gun violence and its impact on children. So we're really happy that you've requested this and that we have this opportunity for this constructive engagement. Um, how do we, I would like, first of all, to also recognize that we have with us to my furthest right, Commissioner Caballero, who is also the Rapporteur for the Rights of Children. Um, of course, Tanya Renon, our Executive Secretary, needs no introduction from me, and to the left, Commissioner um, Denise. Um, so how are we going to organize our time in the usual way? 20 minutes for civil society, 20 minutes for the state. Um, and then the, we will have up to 20 minutes to comment, but I suppose we can take less time so that there's more interaction. And then we close with further 12 minutes um, to the civil society and 12 minutes to the state. So with that, with the clock on the screen, I invite civil society to make its presentation. If we could start with the video. The right to see my sister get married to get my driver's license. To have a career. To water my plants. To argue with my mom about everything. The right to go camping. To go on a road trip. To learn the constellations. To eat a really good pulled pork sandwich. The right to have a terrible breakup. To have a first kiss. Ew. Abrazar a mis hijos. The right to grow old. The right to grow old. Or... To sing in the shower. The right to fall in love. To feel safe. The right to see what I look like when I grow up. The right to not be shot. The right to not be shot. At a theater. At a school. At a nightclub. At a bowling alley. The right. The right. The right to not be shot. To not be shot. To not be shot. Be shot. To be shot. To not be shot. To not have to mourn my friends. To not be shot. The right to a future that our son will never have. On February 14th, 2018, our son, Joaquin Oliver, was shot at Parkland High School. In his name, we're suing the United States government for putting gun rights over his right to live. the slide the next slide please uh, honorable commissioners and member states my name is jonathan lowey <clears throat> and i'm president and founder of global action on gun violence thank you for inviting me to speak at this important hearing for over 27 years i've worked to stop gun violence and trafficking representing victims of gun industry negligence including the government of mexico in its current anti-gun trafficking litigation while Professor Carrillo and I represent the Olivers in the action discussed in the video you've just seen, 
we in the Olivers will be speaking today on the broader problem of the human rights effects of gun violence in the U.S. If we could go to the next slide. We have submitted a detailed joint report that I invite you all to read. It explains how the U.S. suffers from a gun violence epidemic in which every day 300 people are shot, 100 fatally, and mass shootings occur almost twice a day. And it explains the causes of that crisis. Today, I have one central message, that the United States has failed woefully to enact and enforce adequate gun control laws and that failure has enabled gun companies to act with impunity when recklessly supplying the gun market, resulting in over one million people in the United States being injured or killed by gunfire every decade. I have three key subpoints to make. My first point is that the supply of crime guns is not inevitable. It results from the deliberate reckless choices of the gun industry who choose to put profits and sales over people and safety. The gun industry knows who supplies the criminal gun market and how to stop that supply. The industry has been told by U.S. law enforcement for over 20 years that virtually all crime guns, 90 percent, are sold by about 5 percent of gun dealers. Those dealers supply the crime gun market through reckless and illegal practices, such as bulk and repeat sales to obvious gun traffickers and to straw buyers who buy guns intended for someone else. In cases I have been involved in, one licensed gun dealer sold 85 guns in a single all-cash sale to an obvious trafficker. One of those guns was used to shoot a high school basketball player. Another dealer sold a trafficker 65 guns in dozens of one to two gun sales over many months. One of those guns armed a white supremacist who killed multiple people, including an African-American father, as he jogged with his children. The children shown on this slide are Fahim Thomas Childs, Zeus Graham, Anthony Oliver, and Nafis Jefferson. Each one lost his life from guns sold in illegal straw sales by reckless gun dealers. In the next slide, you, you will see undercover sting footage of a licensed gun dealer caught deliberately selling a gun in what appears to be an illegal straw purchase, even explaining that what he's doing is illegal. Yet gun manufacturers deliberately choose to supply dealers like these even when they repeatedly sell crime guns and engage in reckless and illegal practices known to supply traffickers. In 2001, the U.S. Department of Justice told gun manufacturers they, quote, could substantially reduce the illegal supply of guns by taking steps to control the chain of distribution for firearms, but they refused in order to profit off the criminal market. My second point is that these reckless gun industry practices <clears throat> are enabled by serious gaps in U.S. gun laws. In most states, licensed dealers are allowed to sell unlimited quantities of guns to purchasers for no reason. Dealers are, required, are not required to train their employees or to screen for gun trafficking indicators. Unlicensed sellers are allowed to sell guns without any background check whatsoever. Gun manufacturers can supply their guns to dealers who repeatedly sell crime guns, even when the manufacturers know that those dealers sell guns illegally. Military-style assault weapons, such as AR-15s, can be sold to the general public, even to 18-year-olds. Purchasers are not required to obtain a license or to state a reason why they want a gun, nor are they required to register their gun. In many ways, the gun industry in the United States that sells the most deadly consumer product, guns, is less regulated than any other industry. Federal law provides the, the gun industry with special protection from civil liability that no other industry enjoys. Guns are the only consumer product exempt from federal consumer product safety regulation. And as I've said in previous hearings, immunity leads to impunity. 
My third point is that the gun industry's reckless and illegal practices are also enabled by the inadequate enforcement of existing gun control laws. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, ATF, is responsible for enforcing and implementing gun control laws, but as our report details, ATF is underfunded, understaffed, and undermined by legislation. Although ATF action has increased in recent years, gun dealers continue to be rarely inspected and even more rarely lose their licenses. And I should add that the U.S. gun law regime causes a regional crisis, since U.S. guns also supply the crime gun pipeline to Mexico, Haiti, Jamaica, and throughout the Americas. Last week's elections will likely lead to less regulation, less enforcement, and if anything, more immunity for the gun industry. In conclusion, the failure of the United States to enact and enforce adequate gun control laws allows gun industry actors to act with impunity when recklessly supplying the gun market, resulting in many thousands of individuals losing their lives. As will be demonstrated by Professor Arturo Carrillo, who will speak next, this deficient regulatory regime has a far-reaching, profoundly negative impact on persons in the U.S. and abroad. Thank you, John. Honorable Commission, uh, I am Arturo Carrillo, and I will be speaking today specifically about the impact of firearm violence in the United States on children and adolescents, especially those belonging to communities of color in this country. Firearm violence today is the leading cause of death for children and teenagers in the United States. From 2012 to 2022, nearly 20,000 children under the age of 17 died as a result of gun violence. In 2020 alone, uh, guns killed approxim approximately 4,700 minors ages 1 to 19. These numbers, however, do not reflect another insidious dimension of firearm violence. It's disproportionate impact on children and adolescents of color especially African-American youth. Black children and teens are 13 times more likely to be killed by a firearm than their white peers. Latinx children and teens are two times more likely to be killed by a firearm than their white peers. The primary forms of, of firearm violence uh, experienced by American children and adolescents that I will focus on in this testimony are accidental shootings, suicides, and assaults, which includes homicides all enabled by the ease of access to firearms that uh, Mr. Lowy just described. I will now briefly address each of these modalities. Accidental shootings. 40% of deaths resulting from an accidental shooting happened to children between the ages of two and four. This year to date, there have been already at least 200 accidental shootings by children, which have resulted in at least 75 deaths and 130 injuries. But that's merely the tip of the iceberg. I say at least because it, is, it has been notoriously difficult to collect data on child accidental shootings in the U.S., in large part because of the obstacles that the firearm industry has placed in the way of that research. But this much we know. Today, there are 4.6 million children, 4.6 million children in this country living in their homes with loaded and unlocked firearms. So it's not a question of whether more children will lose their lives and be injured at the hands of guns, but when, how fast, and how many. In particular, black children are at risk for accidental shootings. Data from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, indicates that in 2021, black children were under five were killed in accidental shootings at a rate higher than that of any other grouping or category of kids. And this does not just impact children of color. Accidental shooting deaths among African Americans of all ages in 2021 was twice as high as that of their white counterparts. Suicides. Suicide is the third leading cause of death for Americans ages 10 to 24. In 2019, suicide by firearm accounted for 45% of adolescent suicides, nearly half of all adolescents who kill themselves kill themselves with guns. The likelihood of death from attempts at suicide nearly triples when access to a firearm is easily available. And we know that 90% of suicide attempts that use a gun are, are, are fatal compared to 4% that use other means. So the correlation 
uh, between the ready availability of firearms in American households and adolescent suicides is as evident and painfully obvious as it is in the case of accidental shootings. There is, moreover, an epidemic of suicide among black adolescents. Between 20, 20, uh, 2007 and 2020, the suicide rate among black youths aged 10 to 17 increased by 144%. In 2021, 15% of black high school students uh, reported attempting suicide, and 19% reported that they had made plans to commit suicide. So firearms are the leading mode of suicide among black boys in the United States, approximately one half of which uh, of those who attempt a suicide use a gun, and of those, as we've seen, most are successful. Assaults and homicides. Nearly 63% of firearm-related deaths among children and adolescents are homicides. Most of those killings, or many of them, disproportionately impact black adolescent males and often occur when the child or youth is an innocent bystander to ongoing violence uh, either at home or on the street. Uh, indeed, for children under the age of 13, 85% of firearm assaults occur in the home as a result of domestic violence or a family dispute where a gun is available. Outside the home, poor black children are three to four times as likely to be exposed to firearm violence in their neighborhoods than similarly situated white children. Once, once again, the data confirms that minors are frequently the victims, whether at home or on the street, of violent behavior exacerbated by the ready availability of firearms. I'll conclude with a word about mass shootings uh, to allow uh, time to, uh, for my colleagues to, to round out our testimony. Mass shootings between 2009 and 2018 were in the United States were 57 times as many as those in any comparable country, any other developed uh, country uh, with an advanced economy. As of September 2024, there were at least 50 such shootings already in the country. 37 of those mass shootings took place on primary school campuses, elementary schools. 24 students and other victims were killed and another 66 injured. The psychological impact of these shootings, aside from the physical impact it has on survivors and, uh, and the victims, is, is profound. The U.S. Surgeon General, in his uh, June 2024 advisory on the public health crisis of firearm violence in the United States, details both the psychological uh, impact of firearm violence on youths uh, uh, through mass shootings and also generally. Um, and this uh, report was an annex to the uh, joint report that we filed with the commission uh, in support of our testimony at this hearing. Uh, I will stop there and just say that based on the foregoing, we urge this honorable commission to continue to study the impacts of firearm violence on children and minority communities uh, as a part of a general report on the crisis of firearm violence and human rights in the United States, of which I will talk more in uh, the time uh, allotted for responses. Thank you. I now pass uh, the floor to Manny and Patricia Oliver, who you saw uh, a moment ago in the video. Good afternoon. I am Patricia Oliver, I'm the proud mom of Joaquin. And because we're here in the city, I want to share a little story about Joaquin and I when we were here. When he was 10, I brought him here to explore the capital, visit museums, and discover the world around us. On our last day, I asked him if he wanted to hope on the red bus to see more of the city. And he replied, no, mommy, I'd rather go back to the museums to see what we didn't finish. Today, I stand here before you heartbroken. Not just as a grieving mom, but as a witness to grave violations of human rights. The right to live. Joaquin's life was taken from him, a right that should be guaranteed to every child. Thank you. My name is Manuel Oliver. <clears throat> I am Joaquin Oliver's dad, and I, I am, I'm here with, with some hope feeling that I haven't felt in a while. Uh, since we lost our beautiful son, Joaquin, that you can see in that amazing photo, um, we've been trying every single way to get this um, justice show a little bit in our life. 
Uh, we have been to the U.S. Senate. We have been to the U.S. Congress. We have been to the Oval Office. And we run out of entities. And that's why I have hope today. Maybe the answer to all this is not inside the United States, but outside of the United States. And we need to try that. And I will try whatever it takes to honor my son. Like a father. Like fathers and mothers in this room. This is what we do. This is my most important role. And let me tell you something. You don't want to be sitting on this side of the table. No one here, no one that is watching this Zoom meeting. You want to hear numbers? I'll give you numbers. 17. That was the age of Joaquin when he was shot. Four. Four times than they are 15 in his school. That was on Valentine's Day. Joaquin was really happy about Valentine's Day. We bought flowers for his girlfriend the night before. And that morning, that morning, Joaquin was ready to rock and roll. He was dressing like never before. He was looking so handsome. We made some coffee, and I gave him a ride to school. We were listening to some music before we got there. Frank Ocean. If you haven't listened to Frank Ocean, I recommend it. Search. And then when we got to the school, he said, I love you, papi. And I said, I love you, enano. That's how I used to call him. He gave me a kiss. He walked away from the car. And that was the last time that I saw my son alive. I saw him again two days later, dead. He was shot four times with an AR-15. The thing is that Joaquin is not an exception. You saw some photos here from the dealer, from some kids. While I'm talking to you, this is happening. In some city in our country, the most powerful nation in the world, as we like to say, the land of freedom and home of the brave, it's allowing what happened to Joaquin to continue happening. And everybody asks me, what can I do? Well, finally, I have an answer. What can you do? This commission can do a lot. You can help not Joaquin, but the kids of everyone in this room and outside of this room. And I only have 30 seconds left, which is very little, but it's enough for me to ask the commission to please ask a question to the US government. And consider this a question from Joaquin, a question from a young person that is not able to be here, but has a mother and a father. Please ask the US government, is living free from gun violence a fundamental part of the human right to life? Is it? That's the question that we need to ask. Thank you for your time and thank you, thank you from Joaquin, from us for having us here today. Thank you very much representative of civil society. To the parents of Joaquin, Patricia and Manuel, we can only imagine your pain we can only feel your outrage. We give you our solidarity for your insistence on justice, for your team and also for change for all children of this country. We will come back to you with some questions, but I thank you very much for your testimony. And I turn over to Ambassador Mora and the representative of the state for your 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And distinguished commissioners, colleagues at the other table and secretary colleagues. I am Francisco Mora. I'm the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization of American States. I'm here with Deputy Chief of Mission Thomas Hastings, uh, also from the U.S. Mission to the OAS, Christine Sanford, Assistant Legal Advisor, and to my right, Sarah Hunter, Attorney Advisor of the U.S. Department's Office of the Legal Advisor to represent our government uh, at this hearing. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the important work of the Commission to advance human rights in the Western Hemisphere. As you know, the United States remains committed to supporting your work, and it is an honor to appear here before you today. I also want to take a moment to thank, in particular, Manuel and Patricia Oliver for speaking here today. Since their son was killed, they have dedicated their lives to demanding that their government do better. That kind of advocacy is rare and necessary. 
and we thank them for keeping <clears throat> attention on this important issue. The United States has received uh, that petition and will respond as soon as we can. With that said, as this is a thematic hearing under Article 66 of the Commission's rules and not a petition-based hearing under Article 64, our remarks today will focus on the issues discussed in the hearing request. We expect that there may be questions today that, are, that we are unable to answer. If that is the case, we will be sure to take those back for consideration and respond as a, in writing as appropriate. Uh, now, turning to the substance of our presentation, I will first discuss the relevant frameworks in which the issues today are situated and then turn to the actions being taken to address gun violence in the United States. Let me first talk about the issue of due diligence and the question of obligations related to the actions by private parties. While gun violence is a pressing issue in the United States and one that requires a whole of government approach to address, the United States reiterates that under international human rights law, there's not generally a due diligence duty to prevent the crimes or civil wrongs by private parties, even where these actions might undermine an individual's enjoyment of their rights. We will not belabor this point as the United States has made it before in sub submissions and hearings before the commission, including on this topic. But we reiterate that despite the commission's position to the contrary, the American Declaration is not a source of binding legal obligation on states and substantive obligations contained in human rights treaties such as the American Convention cannot be imported into the American Declaration. It remains a statement of moral and political commitments. These legal views should not be understood to mean that the United States does not take the issue of gun violence seriously. As a matter of domestic law and policy, this issue is of central importance. And as we will detail later in our presentation, this administration has taken unprecedented actions to address this epidemic. But we reassert that as a matter, again, of international human rights law, gun violence committed by non-governmental private actors and states, regulation of firearms and state actions to address this type of private violence lie beyond the Commission's competence to consider. Before detailing the administration's actions to reduce gun violence, it is important to understand the relevant legal frameworks at issue as these dictates the type and scope of regulations available to address gun violence here in the United States. Nowhere in the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man is there an article addressing any individual right to keep and bear firearms. However, the Bill of Rights the United States Constitution does set forth such a right. Accordingly, the constitutional right to bear arms must be the starting point for any discussion of firearms in the United States. The Second Amendment to the United States Constitution states that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of, of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end of quote. The United States Supreme Court has held that the Second Amendment provides covered individuals with the right to keep and bear arms for traditionally lawful purposes such as self-defense within the home. The Supreme Court has nonetheless recognized that this, is, this right is not unlimited. Now let me turn to our government's efforts to address this particular issue of gun violence. While there are both federal and state laws that address firearms possession and use, we will primarily focus here on federal restrictions. In advance of the hearing, we provided the commission with various um, fact sheets and reports that go into greater detail on these efforts and encourage the commissioners to review um, these materials. In 2022, President Biden signed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years. This sweeping legislation contains provisions to address gun violence from every angle. First, 
It seeks to ensure that guns don't end up in the hands of individuals whom federal and state laws prohibit from possessing, receiving, transporting, or shipping firearms who will misuse them. For instance, the legislation contains provisions to prevent stolen firearms from being resold and enhance background check requirements for firearm purchasers under the age of 21. This includes specifically requiring checks of juvenile criminal history <clears throat> and mental records. As of September of 2024, over 300,000 of these enhanced checks have been completing, completed, leading to the prevention of nearly 900 firearm purchases by those flagged in these checks. In April 2024, the Department of Justice also finalized a regulation clarifying a key phrase, making it clear who is, quote, engaged in business, in the business, end of quote, of dealing in firearms. This regulation aims to clamp down on over 20,000 unlicensed dealers who engage in the business of dealing firearms online or gun shows and by other means as well. These unlicensed dealers will now be required to have a license to engage in the business of dealing in firearms and must therefore conduct background checks. The legislation also created new criminal offenses for unlawful trafficking in firearms and to address straw purchasers, those who purchase a firearm on behalf of an individual prohibited from possessing uh, one. As of September of 2024, over 600 indiv individuals have been charged under these provisions. New sentencing guidelines seek to increase penalties for violations of these laws. Another critical element of the legislation was to narrow what was been referred to as boyfriend loophole. The law prohibits those convicted of misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence from owning a firearm when those crimes are committed in the context of a dating relationship. So far this year, the gun background check system has blocked over 5,000 sales to individuals convicted of misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence. Given that state and local governments are critical in curtailing gun violence, the legislation also includes $750 million for states to implement crisis interventions such as red flag laws, which are tools that allow the temporary removal of firearms from individuals deemed by a court to be a danger to themselves or to others. The unfortunate reality is that while the legislation <clears throat> and other laws aim to prevent future harm, these laws are not panaceas or cannot undo past harm. That is why the legislation contains provisions to bolster mental health programs in schools and help young people deal with the trauma and grief resulting from gun violence. It provided $1 billion to these efforts, which includes about $285 million to hire and train 14,000 mental health professionals in schools over the next five years. To coordinate interagency efforts to address gun violence, the president also created the first White House Office on Gun Violence Prevention, or OGVP, which is overseen by Vice President Harris. This office has taken great strides to increase implementation of the legislation and spearhead other gun violence initiatives. For instance, after releasing the too few states had, had access federal funds available for crisis prevention, the OGVP engaged state governments, leading to a tripling of the number of states that are using or plan to use that funding. With additional outreach, we expect that the number of participating states will increase even further. President Biden has also issued a number of executive action actions over the past year or so to combat gun violence. 
These include actions to declare gun violence a public health crisis, increase restrictions on firearm exports, and to disrupt illicit trafficking networks. These many efforts are beginning to show results. The Department of Justice reported that from January to June of this year, homicides dropped by 17% compared to the same last year. In addition, data from Gun Violence Archive indicates that the number of mass shootings to date in 2024 has decreased by 20% compared to the same period last year. During her visit to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland this year, the Vice President, Vice President Harris, announced new initiative to keep guns out of the hands of people in crisis. These include the Department of Justice's launch of the National Extreme Risk Protection Order Resource Center, run by the John Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions. This center will provide training and technical assistance to law enforcement officials, prosecutors, attorneys, judges, clinicians, victim service, and social service providers, community organizations, and behavioral health professionals responsible for implementing laws designed to keep guns out of the hands of people who pose a threat to themselves or to or to others. Vice President Harris also uh, stressed the need for states to pass red flag laws and to use available federal funding to help implement such laws. This funding can support training for the judiciary and court staff, educating family members on what to do when they see warning signs, and training first responders in recognizing signs of crisis. Additionally, the Justice Department's Office of Justice Programs awarded over $370 million to states, territories, and the District of Columbia under the Burn State Crisis Intervention Program created by the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act to help key jurisdictions implement crisis prevention strategies. In addition, the Office of Justice Programs awarded $8 million across fiscal years 2023 and 2024 to support training and technical assistance under this program, including $3.5 million that was awarded to the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence uh, Solutions. So the administration has also taken uh, strides to address the problem of unsecured firearms in the home. This is crucial in the context of school shootings, as the National Threat Assessment Center found that 76% of school shootings are committed with guns from the home. Finally, the administration has made historic investments in community violence interventions, a total of over $270 million for the Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative. While we will not go into detail here, in addition to federal regulations, the U.S. state and local governments have a central role to play in combating gun, uh, gun violence as well. In May of 2024, the White House Office for Gun Violence Prevention convened over 80 leaders from city and local offices of violence prevention in over 50 cities across the country to share common challenges their offices face and then identify what collaboration with local, state, and federal offices can and should look like, discuss the importance of raising awareness around gun violence prevention work, and share information on federal resources available to their offices. In July of 2024, the OGVP convened over 30 officials from 16 states, including 12 states, with offices of violence prevention to again discuss federal resources available for their work and strengthen the network of violence prevention advocacy at the state level. Further, the office has released a Safer States Agenda, which details legislative actions that states can pursue to curb gun violence. Since December of 2023, over 30 states have introduced new legislation to do just that. To conclude, 
distinguished co commissioners and participants. All levels of government are engaged on combating the scourge of gun violence. But work, more work needs to be done. We appreciate the continued efforts by civil society to raise concern on this issue and provide critical input into government efforts. Thank you, and we await your questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mora. Um, Commissioner Cabero, would you wish to make any comments or ask any questions? Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much. My apologies, I have to speak in Spanish better. Thank you. Pues quiero saludar a, la, a las personas a la, de la clínica, al peticionario, especialmente eh, mis, mis condolencias a, y mi sentir a los padres de Joaquín Oliver. Es, un, es una pérdida tremenda. Me solidarizo, me solidarizo con su historia, con su pérdida, con su experiencia y con su valor que es tan, tan relevante y tan testimonial para nosotras y nosotros ahora. Gracias por, por venir a compartir esto con la Comisión Interamericana. Saludo al embajador de los Estados Unidos ante la OEA, señor Fred Mora, y a la delegación del Estado. Eh, es mucho, tenemos poco tiempo, es mucho lo que, lo que se me viene a, a la cabeza de reflexión de lo que puede hacer la Comisión. Ya la Comisión, afortunadamente, es, eh, ha estado muy presente en esto. Es, es, es muy particular desde... Entiendo una primera audiencia en, en el 174 periodo de sesiones en 2019. Ya se celebró una audiencia sobre el impacto de la violencia armada en los Estados Unidos. La comisión se preocupa además por conocer el efecto desproporcionado de la violencia armada, como ya se dijo, en personas afrodescendientes, en mujeres y niños, en, en colectivo LGBT. Yo tengo muy en la mente el, el tema de Impulse, del, del Pulse, del, del Centro de Recreación en 2016 en Florida. Eh, quiero además de, de pues destacar estos datos, hacer algunas preguntas, concretamente Arturo Carrillo, que, que nos dio una, una, una información muy, muy particular. Sobre los niños y niñas, decía usted que 40% de niñas de 2 a 4 años sufren disparos accidentales, así fue, si es esto, si esto y que no es posible recopilar los datos, es, esa es una pregunta. La otra es de el dato de que 4.6 millones de niños viven con armas cargadas a disposición, esto es armas que tienen sus padres en, en, en control, esto nada más quisiera ver si tiene algún dato, es un dato pues espeluznante, me parece, en tema de, de la niñez. Y al Estado eh, a saludar estos esfuerzos que están haciendo, sobre todo el tema del, del, de la política de salud, los 14 mil profesionales de la salud mental en, en las escuelas, es, es muy particular esto. Pero no sé, yo preguntaría si hay una política pública especial para colectivos que pueden estar en especial vulneración ante el tema de las armas estos efectos desproporcionados de los que ha hablado y visibilizado la Comisión desde el 174 periodo de sesiones, por ejemplo, escuelas, eh, educación inicial, universidades, además de estos profesionales, para quien puede portar un arma, ¿cómo, ¿cómo se cuida a las niñas y a los niños? ¿Cómo se cuida donde pueda haber concentración de la comunidad LGBTI? ¿Cómo se cu cuida donde pueda haber concentración de minorías raciales? Me parece que, claro, tienen la Constitución, el artículo segundo establece la aportación de las armas, hay una interpretación restrictiva de lo que nos decía usted de la Corte, pero mientras haya este marco normativo, pues entiendo que Estados Unidos tiene que hacer mucho más para visibilizar la problemática de salud mental, pero visibilizar también el cuidado. Esas serían mis preguntas y muchas gracias por por estar aquí esta tarde. Muy importante esta audiencia. Gracias, Presidenta. Commissioner Denise, who is also the Rapporteur for the Rights of Afro-Descendants and Racism. Please go ahead, Commissioner Denise. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I also thank the delegations of civil society for the presentation. 
as well as the delegation of uh, the state. This is um, this is a topic that we touches us all every day. Not because the victims are families in most of the cases, but because it's publicized, it's televised, it's in social media. Every day, I think one of the, the statistics said 118 persons a day, which is four in 24 hours, four every hour. So, and going back to the statements of the Inter-American Commission, several statements on gun violence, this is what was the summary. In all statements, the Inter-American Commission has called upon the state of the United States to implement more restrictive laws to control the possession and carrying of weapons to reduce gun-related violence. Regarding the context of school shootings, the Commission has urged the United States of America to adopt measures to protect children from any type of violence, to guarantee safe educational spaces, and to provide psychological assistance to the families of survivors. The Commission has also emphasized the importance of effective background checks and psychological testing, as well as other effective measures on license and registration requirements. This includes restrictions on assault weapons so that their possession is limited to state forces. So to the state, I have two questions. What concrete steps has the state taken to implement the Commission's recommendations for more restrictive laws on firearms possession and carrying, particularly regarding assault weapons? What specific measures has the state taken to address the disproportionate impact of gun violence on Afro-descendant persons, women, and children, as highlighted also by the Commission? Civil society. How do civil society organizations evaluate the effectiveness of existing background check systems and what improvements would you recommend? And then to both Mr. and Mrs. Olivier, also my condolences and sympathy. You both reflected on moments with your son. You reflected on a moment when he was 10 and you were in DC, here in Washington. And Mr. Olivier reflected on a moment shortly before he wasn't there. I wanna ask you if there is time to just tell us about your son. Who was he? How has his loss impacted you? But not only you, the wider community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Demis. Um, Executive Secretary, Renan. Thank you, Madam President. I will speak in Spanish. Um, muchas gracias. Eh, a la ilustre representación del Estado y gracias a la sociedad civil por esta conversación. Eh, conocemos el caso en la Comisión Interamericana que ya está en fase de admisibilidad, eh, notificado al Estado, y solamente creo que es muy importante el litigio estratégico en este tipo de casos y queremos agradecerlo mucho porque es el tipo de casos que pueden determinar después cambios en la política pública para otras personas, para ver al futuro. Y, y mirando al futuro, eh, pienso eh, 
en, en los avances que comentaba el embajador Mora que se han hecho en esta administración. Y creo que la pregunta fundamental es cómo hacerlos sostenibles y cómo hacer que la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos pueda ayudar al Estado de los Estados Unidos a hacer esos cambios legislativos sostenibles frente a nuevas legislaturas que probablemente estén más proclives a un libre tránsito de armas o a unas políticas públicas más diferentes a la libertad de pertenencia de las armas. ¿Cómo podemos ayudar para que esos cambios legislativos que se han impulsado en esta administración sean sostenibles en el tiempo ante un eventual cambio legislativo que eh, flexibilice la pertenencia de armas de fuego. Muchas gracias y muchas gracias a los representantes por estar aquí. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. Uh, good afternoon once again to representatives of civil society, to the uh, Oliver family, and of course, representative state. I have uh, uh, one comment and some two questions or three questions. First of all, I want to start off by recognizing the, the efforts at, at gun control which have been made at the federal level and which Ambassador Morris spoke about, and which despite the magnitude of this problem seems to be showing some early promise. I think you said, Ambassador Morris, there's seen, you've seen a 17% drop in homicides and also a reduction in mass shootings by 20%. We can only hope that these efforts will, will, will be sustained and we will be paying close attention to that. Okay, so on the on the analysis uh, that, you've, that has been presented here about the sort of the the, dem the impacts on different demographic populations my question is this what is your analysis um representatives of civil society but of course the state can also respond because i'm sure you've done studies as well what is your analysis of the causes of this disproportionate impact on gun violence on african american communities and in particular boys I'm asking that question not in a, rhetor in a rhetorical way, but, but from the point of view of thinking about prevention approaches. And then in relation to the constitutional guarantees, the right to bear arms, um, is there a consensus that this is uh, not an unrestricted right? In other words, yeah, I guess it, that's my question. Is there a consensus within the United States across the political divide that this right is not completely unrestricted? And if there's not any consensus, even at the lowest level, what kinds of arguments are being advanced across the political continuum, or let's see, even say the, the, the social culture, that is in, that what kind of arguments are impeding the, the actions for gun control? I would like to understand the argumentation for unrestricted access to guns, if, if there is such an argument. I don't want to presume that. And for the and for the for the Olivia family, my question is: in, the, in your advocacy, done with great courage, great insistence, what what reception? How are you received by people who are in the policy-making space who can make a change? What is their response to what you're what you're telling them? Those are our questions. And so uh, we have 12 minutes on either side. 12 minutes starting with civil society organizations and 12 minutes for the state. Thank you so much, commissioners. And, and uh, uh, I'll begin by uh, you know, acknowledging that the current uh, US administration has taken some positive strides and has attempted to do more, um, but has been unable to. Um, however, um, and I, I think um, many of the administration would, would agree with me, um, what has been done is not nearly enough, and the core problems that drive gun violence in the United States really have not uh, been addressed. Um, I, I'd like to get to, to the questions as many as I can. Um, I mean, first, uh, there was a question about uh, the the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms. And I do believe, while there's not a unanimous consensus about anything in the law, there is pretty much a consensus that the Second Amendment is not unlimited. And in my view, uh, even under a uh, expansive view of Second Amendment rights, uh, there is uh, many, many 
laws and regulations that can and should be implemented that would be constitutional under the Second Amendment. Um, expanding background checks, and this goes to one of the other uh, questions. Um, I mean, right now in the United States, while background checks are required when guns are sold by licensed dealers, um, guns are allowed to be sold by unlicensed people. I could sell guns if I wanted to, um, as long as I'm not quote, engaged in the business of selling firearms. And when I sell guns, I do not need to do a background check at all. I mean, literally someone can walk out of prison and and uh, say, I want to buy uh, guns from you, and I could, no questions asked, sell them guns. That would be completely legal as long as I was not engaged in the business. So that's a big problem. Another problem with background checks in the U.S. is only very limited categories of people are prohibited from buying guns. The Parkland shooter um, uh, was someone, 19-year-old, who had dozens of interactions with the police, violent incidents, documented uh, incidents of mental health, yet he was not prohibited from buying guns. And he still, to this day, uh, absent his conviction, but if you had the exact same sort of person with that background, they could go into a gun dealer. They could, if the gun dealer knew their entire history of violence and disturbing behavior, they could buy one gun or unlimited numbers of guns, including assault weapons. And that is a, a big problem. Terrorists are not prohibited uh, from buying uh, guns in the United States unless they fall into some other uh, category. Um, and then just quickly on uh, what studies have been made. I mean, there have been studies have been made about the effectiveness of all these laws. The summary is, uh, one, states with stronger gun laws have far fewer gun deaths than states with weaker gun laws. Of course, countries with stronger gun laws that are comparable to the U.S. have something like 20, 25 times less as far as gun uh, gun violence rates. So it's clear that gun laws, uh, you know, work, but they just have not been fully affected uh, or implemented in the United States. Ms. Gloria, about the question of Joaquin. I picked this story about me being with him here in the in DC because he wanted to come here on a spring break. And it got myself by surprise. The fact that I asked him to have something, to do something fun, to be, you know, hooping on the tourist bus and look around. And instead he came back to me to that answer. I was really amazed with that answer of him. And that tells you the way Joaquin was. Since he was little, he couldn't read because he was very little. He asked his sister to read for him. When he couldn't play because he was very little, video games, he asked his sisters to play for him. So he was always curious about, even though he couldn't do it, he was looking for somebody to look for him to, you know, to be able to learn and to know more. And that's the Joaquin, that's the one that we lost. Joaquin was always curious about life, was caring about the every single social issues that we had in, in this country and the world. And we have a lot of uh, writing posts that he made. He was an excellent writing. And he started being worried about gun violence since he was 12 years old. When he was in his language and arts class, he wrote a letter about background checks, why we didn't have background checks and why people was you know, against that law. So that tells you about more that Joaquin, the kid, the sensitive kid. And that's why today, Manuel and I, we keep ourselves working hard, tirelessly. Since more than six years, we've been bringing that flag of Joaquin's name because he was doing a lot and we were just following his lead. And that's what is so important for us to see really important movements moving forward because we keep dying every day and we keep violating everybody's right. And I see we, because we are part of this collective, we are part of this society and we have to stop this for, from happening. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I had a few options here. 
to tell you the things that that we do. Um, I the the state um, just told us uh, how much effort the administration did for for putting things in a better place. Um, I think the state missed the fact that we were part of those solutions. The administration wouldn't have been able to do it without people like Patricia, without organizations like the ones that we have out there. So we totally agree with those changes. The fact is that the administration won't be here anymore. This is not against an administration. This is against a whole tendency to normalize the fact that people can just carry weapons and kill each other by fear. So yes, the administration won't be here anymore, but guess who's gonna be here? Patricia will be here and other mothers will be here. And sadly but true, more mothers and more fathers will be here suffering the same pain. So that's my main issue here. This is beyond an administration. Now, what can we do in the next two months? That would be a great question to answer. Is there anything that we can do before? Because here we're all hoping that things will stay the way that this administration is living it. But I certainly have to think that it's not going to happen. All right. Now, I'm going to uh, answer to you about the reception of what we do. What we do is this. What we do is break the mold. What we do is motivate young people to get out there and reject a future that has a minimum risk of losing more people. We support the young, and there's millions of young Americans that agree with what we're doing and support what we do. We cannot protect Joaquin, but we can protect a lot of kids that are still out there. Uh, thank you, uh, commissioners, for your uh, thoughtful questions. Uh, Commissioner Caballero, on the statistics uh, related to accidental shootings of uh, small children or among small children, and, and Commissioner Clark on the impact of firearm violence on uh, communities of color and, and black youth in particular. Uh, we do have with us written testimony. My uh, testimony is based on a written testimony document, which I am um, distributing now that has the citations to the reports that document and substantiate the the information I presented. So rather than spend uh, this limited time, uh, you have that as a starting place. Let me add that the topic of impact on children, adolescents, and uh, communities of color is the subject of a supplementary report that we are working on, that we are developing to submit to the commission. Uh, as a complement uh, to the report that we already submitted, the detailed joint report, which presents a general view. So you have the, t the written testimony with the substantiation and las fuentes de, de las cifras que, que nombre, and, uh, and we are available to speak with you about any of this material. Uh, I do want to uh, conclude our intervention by uh, Re requesting of, of the commission that it uh, do a couple of things. One is urge uh, the the state, the United States, uh, to recognize uh, that uh, due diligence uh, is an obligation uh, that is very much uh, pertinent to this discussion. The duty to protect uh, entails the duty to prevent foreseeable harm uh, to citizens, even from third parties, a well-established uh, interpretation of that principle. And just to cite two examples, you know, the um, easy availability uh, and the widespread um, uh, uh, possession of uh, assault weapons in U.S. society, uh, the fact that many, not all, but many mass shootings are carried out using assault weapons, Parkland included. Uh, there is a foreseeability uh, there that is preventable. The assault weapon ban of several decades ago lowered the rate of gun massacres and death from uh, shootings as a result. So there is a duty. It is does apply, and there are steps to be taken there. The, accident, the accidental shootings of children, unintentional discharges uh, of weapons by children, weapons that are loaded and unlocked, unprotected in homes, foreseeable 
preventable due diligence. Uh, and so to that end, we conclude by respectfully requesting that the commission continue its inquiry into the firearm violence crisis in the United States by uh, undertaking the preparation of a report on that top, on that subject specifically that would encompass all the issues that we we're talking about, uh, the duties of the state, uh, the different um, uh, dimensions of the problem, some that we haven't even talked about uh, in depth here, like the uh, legal immunity, uh, the, the lack of remedies for victims like the Olivers, uh, who cannot pursue ju uh, judicial action against the gun manufacturers of the AR-15, the Smith & Wesson in this case, because they're prohibited by the Protection of Legal Commerce and Firearms Act, PLACA. Uh, all these topics should be covered in a thorough report uh, that the commission would undertake, uh, and it would include uh, looking at uh, the failure to regulate the firearm industry and the complicity, the role of the firearm industry actors that Mr. Lloyd was describing in contributing to the firearm violence. The commission has spoken on corporate responsibility standards in the Americas that apply in just these kinds of situations. And I will just conclude by saying we are at your disposal uh, as a resource, um, as allies in the preparation of that report, uh, you know where to find us. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much and for those excellent suggestions. Um, Ambassador Mora, I turn over to the state. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, commissioners, I'd like to, for the questions, turn it over to Ms. Sarah Hunter from the Office of Legal Advisor of the State Department. Good afternoon, Commissioners and Commissioners on the other side. Um, I want to start by uh, responding to questions that were raised by both uh, Commissioner Caballero and uh, Gloria Demis. Um, as detailed in our affirmative presentation, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act makes available federal funds to communities impacted by gun violence. Um, as many of the initiatives that have taken place under the, that law are fairly new, I don't have uh, at hand information about the exact breakdown of where those funds have gone and how they've been prioritized. Um, but I will take that question back and I will get the relevant agencies um, and get together with the relevant agencies to provide what information we can on that. Um, as, I, as Ambassador Mora noted in our, our main presentation, the United States has to begin with the baseline that the right to our con in our Constitution guarantees a right to keep and bear arms. Though, as we noted, the federal and state governments have adopted a large number of laws regulating such things as the types of guns that may be sold, the categories of persons who are allowed to purchase them. So to your question, um, Commissioner Clark, on whether it's an unrestricted right, it's it's not. Um, just for, for one example, um, except under pretty narrow circumstances, um, people with certain criminal records are not, like felonies, are not allowed to own weapons. And as Ambassador Moore described, um, we there's been expansion to cover certain domestic violence um, uh, perpetrators. Uh, now, the precise contours of the of the laws that can be created are limited uh, and prescribed by the U.S. Constitution. Um, but they're otherwise determined by democratically elected legislators across our federal system. So different jurisdictions have chosen different paths. Some have stricter gun laws, some uh, have less strict gun laws. Um, and for better or worse, what happens there is uh, within the domain of this domestic political uh, process. Uh, as uh, Professor um, Carrillo mentioned earlier, there was at one point an assault weapons ban in 2004 that sunsetted in 2010. Uh, so there have been attempts to, even in this last Congress, I believe, to uh, reinstitute the assault weapons ban, but they have thus far been unsuccessful. Um, and I think I'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll end by, by saying, uh, you know, Joaquin sounds like he was just a really great kid, and I'm sorry that he won't be walking the streets of D.C. anytime soon. Um, I can't imagine what it takes to continue 
to do all the work you both have been doing, and not just in this more legalistic setting, but in the art that you've been uh, doing and the shows that you've been putting on to kind of keep his memory alive. And I can't imagine what that takes when you're consistently met with roadblocks. Um, and I can't speak what the next administration is going to do. None of us can. Uh, but we appreciate your tireless advocacy and expect that the one thing that we can rely on is that you're going to continue to put pressure and have this uh, on your government um, and hold them accountable. Thank you for that. I think we have the end. I think we 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 finished quite early, but um, uh, I don't know. So I think we come to the end. I don't know if anyone has any last words. I'm a little surprised that we've reached the end and it's not half past five yet. But anyways, I just want to to thank uh, everyone here for contributing to this hearing. It's a serious serious issue and it's it is as described as a public health issue but it's also a social justice issue it's also an economic development issue it's also a cultural issue there are many dimensions here what is the cause of a of what seems to be a unregulated production of weapons um and where do they go and yes you are quite right that it's also there's also a regional dimension to that last year we had there was a hearing i believe um Executive Secretary, a, a hearing on the impact of the unregulated gun production and distribution. Last period of sessions. Last period of sessions on other countries in the region. So I think we, we will be paying close attention to this. Um, we welcome the suggestion about the thinking through what would, how would you, def how would we define what the standards are? And yes, does the duty to protect include the duty to prevent foreseeable harm? And what do the standards say about that? And I think that would be useful for the entire region, um, not just for the United States. So we note that um, we, we note that suggestion. Um, we understand from the Oliver family your insistence uh, I, and your demand that your voice be heard and the voices of all the parents be heard and the, and the families and the communities and that everyone is entitled to, to safety. That, that has to be a fundamental human right right to life includes the right to safety, the right to autonomy. Um, so we have a, a shared solidarity uh, on, around this issue, and we will continue to, to do our work. And also, please um, be assured that the Commission is here to listen and to also to listen to your recommendations on what we should do, everyone here. Uh, we, I want to thank Ambassador Mora for his constant support of the Commission's autonomy and independence and its mission, promotion and protection of human rights, and, and the entire team um, with you. Um, Mr. Hastings was a little bit behind, but I still see him. <laughs> and of course, Sarah and the Christina and Christine who I've met today for the first time. <clears throat> um, so we, we don't take it for granted, the support that we've received from your team, Ambassador, and we thank you very much for it. Uh, so, Yes. Yes, I, I just want to say something. Um, <clears throat> I have the feeling that we all agree that this is an issue, and I like to yeah. think that we all agree. Thank you for your Thank you. kind words. Um, if we all agree that this is an issue, I before we leave this, I want to invite everyone, everyone to break the mold. We are taking this as something that is just happening in the United States, and this is how we are. We, we, yes, we kill our kids, move to another place, go back to your country. I've, I've heard that. People have told me that. You get used to it. Get used to what? To kids being murdered? So, this is an invitation to all of us to break the mold. There's millions of Americans waiting for that mold that, that is being normalized in this absurd situation to happen. And I think this is a perfect room to start that breaking the mold. And that includes all parties in this place. So um, again, thank you. Today, today I'm going to bed 
with hope. And it's very hard for someone like me or Patricia to go to bed with hope under these circumstances. So I want to keep that hope. I want to expand that hope to anyone that is in this meeting through Zoom because it's a challenge. Let's take the challenge and let's solve the problem that we all know is a big problem. And with that, you have the last word, Mr. Oliver. <laughs> Thank you very much for everyone and also for your trust in the Commission.